happened over the last two months. He can't even count. That, and thousands. Some, thousands of miles. They went to Washington. He did like five Passover seders uh, over the last week. And um, and I just, I was amazed at what he was telling me and that how the Lord put this partnership of their marriage together. And it's just exciting to see that it doesn't look like they plan on slowing down. I'm pretty sure that they're really going to accomplish uh, great things. I know they've already accomplished great things individually, but the Lord's really going to do a great work. And I'm excited because he already gave me a little hint of what he's preaching to more and uh, the Lord had him last night was speaking to him or earlier this morning speaking to him and it just went right along with him. like I know most of you guys right we talk about things me and Sheree had a big conversation the other day and you know we we're talking about videos and just different things and and all of this stuff coming together and I mean that's what the Lord was speaking to him earlier this morning and I know it's going to be good all right brother here you go praise God oh good to be back with you again uh, I was single the last time I saw you, and it was better tonight. Right? Amen. I look a little bit better tonight. Yeah, still, I just want to bless you tonight. I thank the Lord for his favor tonight. Thank God for his anointing tonight. We feel kind of inadequate. I've been in ministry for over 50 years. Pastoring, evangelism, prison ministries, hospital, all over the world planting congregations, being on boards of new churches and, and Israel all over the world. And I feel a little undone uh, as we minister together. Last weekend, we ministered together for the first time since we've been married February 4th. And uh, we knew each other all of about two months. But uh, God put it together and someday we'll be able to maybe do a brief book on that. and and just be able to share how God will answer your prayers when you cry out. Amen. But tonight, I just want to bless you. I've blessed you right now. Lord, thank you for that anointing, the anointing that is on her life right now. Lord, we thank you for every heart, every life that is here right now, that you speak truth and love in their lives, Lord. You came to set the captives free, to bind up the broken heart, and set at liberty those that are in bondage. Lord, you came even to encourage the, the ones that need to be encouraged, to bring hope to the hopeless light in dark places, Father. You even shine light in the places of our life that we need to have correction in our life. Lord, we don't want to go out the same way we came in. This is not just a gathering uh, and personal things, but it's a it's, it's divine revelation that we ask for tonight. We ask for an encounter, an encounter with you, Lord. No matter if we've been pastoring, Lord, change my heart, deal with my heart, live in my life. Lord, as we look at the bride of Christ and, and Esther, Lord, we look at so many things in the hour that we're living in, Lord. We thank you that, Lord, according to the psalmist, you set us in a COVID position. You let us stand upon the rock. You lift our head above the enemy. We can see him afar off, Lord. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper, Lord. Thank you for the blessed anointing that is on my beloved right now. Thank you for a supernatural power within her, Lord, to discern and to bring forth new gifts in her life, new dimensions in Jill's life tonight. Thank you, Lord, that you launched us over a week ago together on the same platform. Tonight is just the second time we're a little nervous or intimidated, but God, not in you. We pray, Father, that we'll fulfill your call on our life, Lord. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, amen and amen. amen. <laughs> yeah, praise God. He didn't tell you this, but before we got married, I said, I'd like the first three months just for me. I didn't get it. I got one month. <laughs> but he came back and he said, all right, you get one month. He said, I just want to be able to kiss you whenever or wherever I want for the rest of our lives. <laughs> and he is not disappointing me. <laughs> so please, hope doesn't embarrass you. <laughs> I got notes, I got, I need, like, I forgot to tell I need, like, a living room, I need, like, you know, tables and chairs and yes. everything. I just want to say, how many of you know that just because you said something doesn't mean it was heard? Amen. Uh, 
Just because you said it doesn't mean anybody heard it. And just because you wrote something doesn't mean that people read it or understood it. That's right. Is that true? Amen. Yes. Okay. So in case I should say anything you'd like to remember, I have no problem with you taking notes on your phone, or some of you actually might still have a pencil and paper. I know most people don't use pencil and paper anymore. Whatever you want, I don't care. Because the Lord has given me a lot of this information and when Pastor called us, was it two weeks ago? And invited us and he asked if I would speak on Esther and the Bride of Christ. I didn't tell you this, but I was up most of that night. <laughs> I said, I can't do it. I don't know anything. And the Lord really showed me that I did. Um, and the Lord will do that. He will lie. He will allow the enemy to lie to us that we know nothing, that we can do nothing, that we are not effective, that nobody cares about our message. He will tell us all that kind of garbage to keep us from speaking out. Yeah. It is garbage. That's right. Okay, so just give me a minute. Okay. Okay, so. If your parent or your spouse or your best friend came to your house tonight and said, we're going on a big trip, can you come? Would you do it? No time to pack, just I'm going to pick you up in two hours. Come with me. Well, that's what the Lord said to me. He said it to me several times in my life, and very profoundly five years ago. Um, my husband was, um, he had been dying for several years before then. He had dementia and a lot of issues that we didn't even understand. And after he passed away, after a couple of months, I felt a very strong desire. I knew that I needed to be married again and that God wanted me to be married again. And he also made it very clear that it wasn't gonna be where I was. I was living in Alexandria, Virginia. And then I got a knock on the door one night, a new neighbor moved in upstairs and he said, by the way, I just wanna tell you that my brother and I are in construction and I've discovered there's moisture and mildew in all the walls of my condo, and you have it too, probably, and it all, you have to rip everything out and rebuild it, and good night, have a nice night. <laughs> and immediately, I knew I had to deal with something. I mean, you gotta pay a lot of money to have moisture mitigation, you gotta have things measured, and sure enough, there was moisture, and I was the chairperson of the building and grounds committee of this apartment house condo and in my tier like there's tiers so every apartment from where I was down to the first floor up to the roof in my line everybody had moisture mm. and mildew and you know I'm very dumb sometimes and the Lord has to really knock me around to get me to know I got to make a change well how I'm more impressive with the change need to be then you got to get out of there so I have to have the walls ripped out they completely rebuilt cost a lot of money and I have a friend who is my realtor and I called her and told her what was going on I said I'm going to California because I have a ton of Hilton points and I have a son who lives in California and I'm going to go and when I come back and the place is ready I want you to sell it I don't even care what price you get for it get me out of here that's what I said yeah it was scary I mean I said I'm you know so I go do that, I come back, still wasn't finished, so a neighbor invited me to live with her for a week and a half, and finally everything was ready. Realtor put it on the market, and within a week I got a good offer, and I sold it, and I moved where? So I decided I was gonna to go to an apartment, and I called a very plucky friend of mine, very close friend, she's, uh, she's 27 now, so maybe she was like 23 at the time, and I said, and her name was Lydia. <laughs> Aren't you right off of Lydia yes. Street? <laughs> anyway, I said, Lydia, help me get rid of everything. And she got these huge boxes, and we put, I had five sets of dishes. 
because when I had Passover seders and other family gatherings, I want I don't like to use paper. I want to use dishes and paper nap uh, not paper napkins, cloth napkins and all the good stuff. Anyway, she just put stuff in big boxes, load them in my car. She said, drive to Goodwill. And maybe some of you were using my stuff. <laughs> I hope you are. Um, anyway, so I found an apartment that was affordable and I wanted a gas stove. Well, I don't know if you are aware. It's hard to find a place that has gas stoves anymore. Everybody's got electric. So I found a place and it was affordable and I moved in and it was very clear to me that was not gonna be my permanent place. Where am I gonna go? I had no idea. Fast forward, a year and a half later, I was in Florida, I like to be there in the winter because I don't wanna be cold. I live in Texas now. It's very cold when we live in the winter. But um, I was in Florida and I saw a condo and anybody know what the number seven is in the Bible? Completion. Completion. Hmm? Completion. Completion, the end, perfection. Yeah. So I'm driving by this building and it's 10777 <laughs> West Sample Road. And I look it up on my computer later and the units available with a West view, because I got to have sunsets for Shabbat, unit 701. <laughs> the message was not lost on me and um, anyway, I bought it, and then I had the place completely gutted and rebuilt it from the inside out. So we started with a concrete floor and new electric, new vents, new everything, and I had some savings, and I just spent half of it. <laughs> and moved in, and I had this huge list of stuff, work that needed to be completed, and there were like two or three things left on the list, and I go to a conference that I did not want to go, and I met Rabbi Aaron who also did not want to be at that conference. <laughs> I don't know how much of that story I'm going to get into right now, but anyway, within five weeks of December 16th, we were married. <laughs> and I moved to Texas. So the Lord came into my life and moved me from Alexandria, one place, to Alexandria, another place, to Florida, to Texas. And quite frankly, we are renting a house right now. We have no idea where we're gonna be, where we're gonna settle, are we gonna settle? I happen to be of Levite extraction and Rabbi is a Kohen, the priesthood lineage, and we're supposed to be nomads anyway, and not <laughs> own anything. So, you know, that's what it is. And I have been downsizing my whole, I've, I've been downsizing, I keep getting rid of stuff. I'm not sentimental and people say, how could you possibly do that? And I say, it's easy and I'll come over and show you what to do. <laughs> so the point is, I've been getting ready for what? I've been getting ready to fulfill God's call on my life and I know that I've been called, but I'm not sure how far, how wide, how deep, how high this call is. But I do know that I never knew I would be in Louisiana. This second time I've been in, I didn't know I'd be in Louisiana. I didn't know I'd be a lot of the places I've been to in the last three months. It's very thrilling to go where God calls you. Amen. Amen. So, anyway, I'm just wondering how many of you could do that? Could you do it? Somebody came to you and said, we're going in two hours, would you go? Could you go? Would you do it? And Rabbi reminded me that courage is not the absence of fear. It's just ability to walk through the storm. You know, we drove here yesterday. I have people who have graciously been praying for me for many, many years, actually since 2006. I sent out a big prayer request and then I was updating them. We drove through some serious, dangerous weather cells. There were times when we, he could barely see out of the windshield and 
I couldn't see the lines on the side of the road. You gotta see something. And and yet we came here because God called us to. We wanted to. Amen. And so far, just you know, to meet you all, to meet Pastor, to talk about the things of God, it's very exciting. So what does this have to do with Esther? So how many of you have ever heard of Esther in the Bible? Stupid question, but raise your hand. So I grew up a conservative Jewish girl in synagogue, and every year we did a Purim pageant, because she always, the story is told during the holiday of Purim. And there are two main female characters. Esther is one, what's the name of the other one? Vashti. Vashti. I was never, chosen to be Vashti. <laughs> True story. The woman, young girl, who was chosen to be Vashti, this is her real name, Jacqueline Beanstalk. <laughs> she was gorgeous. She still is. She has dark, natural skin, um, born in the family from the Middle East somewhere, and she had a gorgeous singing voice, and I was always Vashti. <laughs> Who knew that I would be asked to speak about Esther? Frequently. So I'm getting my licks back. But the point is, I want to ask you something, because I just asked you a question before, could you leave with two hours notice? That would require submission, wouldn't it? And what was Vashti not good at? Submission. King called her. She had a banquet. He had a big banquet. And he said, come. He wanted to show her off to all of his guests. She said, no. So I'm going to ask you a very personal question because I have been asking myself this question. Think for real about yourself and your life and where you are not submitting to God the way he is expecting you to. Yes. So I was born in New Jersey. You ever see the joke, you know, I was born in New Jersey. You got a problem with that? <laughs> That's New Jersey. They say you can take the girl out of New Jersey, but not New Jersey out of the girl. And I hate this, but sometimes I argue. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I, do. I, I hate it and I've been repenting for that I do it, I, it's not like I consciously plan to do it it's kind of maybe I'm going to blame my, my environment but it's kind of like a learned behavior knee jerk reaction let's go here for dinner, I don't like that <laughs> small talk, dinner so I, the Lord has been doing some serious business with me about repenting about the lack of submission in that area. So I want you to think for a minute about your own selves, because I know that I'm human and that you are all human, so we probably have this in common. And would you think of one thing that you have trouble submitting to right now? Would you ask the Lord to reveal it to you, and then we're going to pray about it? Right now. Yes. It might be listening to your parents, it might be following a boss, it might be um, obeying wisdom that was put into you when you were growing up, it may be um, peer pressure, I don't know. I tell my kids to read the book of Proverbs every day. It's a good rule book of life to start off with. And my youngest son, who's a surfer dude, has a lot of problem with submission. And he'll ask my advice occasionally, and I'll say, go back and read the book of Proverbs. Don't stop. So, Lord, please reveal to each one of us at least one thing that we have trouble with in terms of submitting to your will for our lives either submitting to you or in important relationships. Inspire us right now to lay it at your feet, to repent, to actually humble ourselves right now and admit it. 
and ask for your forgiveness. And we know that God's, God forgives us. And I've asked my husband to help me. This is an area that he can help me with. It's between me and God. So we like to blame other people for our problems, don't we? Amen. We're famous for that. But no matter what your early life was like, it's on us to own our own issues and to ask the Lord to help us through yes. and to admit when we have trouble. We don't like to do that. So Vashti is famous for her lack of submission. And in fact, if the book was written differently, women would not even have the desire to want to submit to their husbands. And that's what they were afraid of. That's why the king banished her from the kingdom. All of the advisors said, if we let her get away with this, all the women in the kingdom, and this is a big kingdom, from India to Ethiopia, all the women are going to think it's okay to argue and disagree with their husbands and do what they want to do. So Esther, I just want us to think about this for a minute. She was an orphan, which means her parents died. Now think of Israel right now. Because of the war, there are a lot of people who have been orphaned. Babies, preteens, teenagers, married people. My stepdaughter, the daughter from my deceased husband, she was an orphan. When she heard I was moving, she wanted to know, well, what are you taking? And I said, well, I'm getting rid of all the redundancies in my life. And she said, I'm not redundant, am I? You're not going to get rid of me, are you? And she was dead serious because she is an orphan. So it's very important that she has me in her life. And we've got that gotten closer and closer. So enter Esther. She's an orphan. She lives somewhere in this province of Shushan, and she comes to live with her uncle Mordechai because he was her closest living relative. And she likes him, and he treats her well, and so she does almost everything that he says. We have no record of any rebellion in her at all. And a huge edict came through due to an evil man, and when we tell the story, every time we mention his name, you're supposed to say, boo, this man, his Hebrew name, Haman, and he uh, decreed that all the Jews were to be killed, and um, let's go back to Vashti's banishment, the king wants a bride. So there's a beauty contest, and Mordecai says to Esther, I want you to enter, I want you to go, I want you to be a part of this, and she goes to the palace, and she is chosen among several other beautiful women, and they she undergoes beauty treatments, potions, lotions. You know, she went to the major spa, makes all of our spas look ridiculous. And she's hoping, because her uncle is praying and wants this to happen, that she will be chosen. Now, what's important about this story? A ton of things. But let's look at Haman, and I just want you to know, you know, the war on Israel, so the current war on Israel started October the 6th. 6th and 7th. And starting way back to Esau, when Esau was, well, let's go back to Cain. Cain was banished because he killed Abel. Then Esau comes along and his brother Jacob steals his birthright and he goes to an area where the Amaleks live. Have you heard of that word, the Amaleks? Mm -hmm. I'm glad you know because 99.5% of all the people you know have never heard of the Amaleks. And we have to be prepared to 
tell our story in and out of season. But the Lord asked the Israelites to kill all the Amaleks, not some of them, not the ugly ones, not the ill-prepared ones, all of them. And did they do it? No. no. And Haman is from the lineage of the Amaleks, which has continued to this day in Hamas and Hezbollah in the Gaza in Israel. People think, oh, let's uh, broker, well, let's have a two-state um, solution and let's uh, get rid of the animosity and everybody will, you know, shake hands and, and we'll be friends now for the rest of our life and play nice in the sandbox. This is not going to happen. That's right. It is not biblically uh, described or, or um, foretold in any way. And I speak of this personally because, unfortunately, my youngest son fell in love with someone who was a descendant of those people. Praise God, she broke up with him three months ago. Amen. Yeah. But the truth has still not dawned on him, although he was healed of a terminal illness when he was seven years old. He should have been dead. And he lives, maybe like Esther, for such a time as this. Because we pray for him, like all of our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, by name, every single day, at least twice a day. And um, I believe the Lord has a purpose of him in mind. Well, I never got to be Esther in the play. But I believe the Lord has chosen me for such a time as this to share my understanding of what it is to be called by God because all of you have a calling too. And I have a friend, I don't think I've ever told you this, um, and we'd be in Bible study meetings and everybody would be talking about these very dramatic examples of how God used them in their life and she would talk about things like, you know, when I ordered pizza and I got an extra piece and I saw somebody who needed it and I gave them the piece of pizza. And people would be like rolling their eyeballs. What are you talking about? That's not a testimony. But regularly in her life, her testimony is very undramatic, very small. And her husband passed away a few months ago. The same thing that my husband died from and she is not crawling around in despair she knows God has prepared her maybe for such a time as this and it's I can't wait to see what God is going to do with her so there's a song that we love if you can use anything Lord you can use me it doesn't matter what your strengths are in fact, if you had, if you wrote down anywhere what it is you had trouble with submission, would you also write down what you think one of your strengths is? And if you don't think you have any strengths, you go home, you ask your best friends, ask your enemies, ask your parents, ask your brothers and your sisters, the people who like you, the people who don't like you, what they think your strengths are, at least one. And as you collect the data, you're going to discover you have at least one strength, no exception. Everyone has a calling. So when God put his hand on my shoulder and I was seven and he said, you are mine, I knew I was different because I'm like what we call an overachiever, right? So. If you have to write a paper in school. When I was in high school, we do a research paper. It does, barely does 10 pages. I do 65 pages. <laughs> and the teacher gave me an A on it. I get it back and she's, I, she's, I said to her, what did you think of it? She said, you didn't expect me to read it, did you? <laughs> and I gave it back to her and I said, yes, I did. <laughs> it's not that it was such a brilliant paper, but I wrote it and she's the teacher and I thought she should read it. Amen. I say, I like it, it's good paper. <laughs> the point is that Esther is in the palace and the king decides that she pleases him the best. 
And it doesn't say that she was the most beautiful or the most talented or she could sing the most beautifully. It was something about her. There's an old Beatles song, Something in the Way She Moves. You know that song? It's an old Beatles song. Something about Esther really pleased the king. And so he calls her to be his queen. And at the same time, and I believe, there is no scriptural proof for this, but I believe that the scripture tells us that the king had trouble sleeping at night. I believe the Lord was waking him up in the middle of the night. How many of you have trouble sleeping when you wake up and you can't go back to sleep and the Lord's like talking to you or he wants you to pray or he wants you to write something down? And I believe that's what's happening to King Akashverus. And so he was bored and he, he didn't really know why he woke up and he asked for some of his courtiers to bring him the book. They kept a diary every day of what was going on in the kingdom. So they read him the story of how two of his workers were plotting to kill him. And Esther's uncle, Mordechai, disrupted the plot and reported it, and those two people were killed. And it was written in the book. And he said, so what do we do for Mordechai? And they said, nothing. So the next morning, he calls his henchman, his prime minister, the, the person who was the most important one in the kingdom, underneath the king, and he said, and he was very cagey about this, he said, and I don't think he knew what he was doing altogether, but he said, what would you do for a man who um, did something very important in the kingdom, who even saved the king's life, and who uh, was very, very important and trustworthy? What would you do for such a man? And Haman is so narcissistic, know that word? Yes. <laughs> and self-centered, and so he's thinking the king's talking about him. Mm -hmm. And so he says, oh, I think we should take this man and put him on the king's best horse. We should put king's robes on him. And we should parade him around the streets out of the courtyard and just heap honors on him. And so the king says, okay, great idea, great idea. Please go get Mordecai and do this for him. <laughs> now, Haman's been trying to get Mordecai to bow down and kiss his ring and swear loyalty to Haman. And Mordecai is Jewish. You don't bow, bow down to anybody except God Almighty. Yes. And um, he is utterly mortified, but he doesn't. And he goes home, and his wife, who's a Vashti clone, in my opinion, she said, well, we, you need to get build a gallows, you, a hanging tree. As we've been driving around Louisiana, there are some gorgeous, you know you have gorgeous trees here. Yeah. And well, they built a gallows. And they were gonna try to do whatever they could to get Mordecai. And there's tons of details that I'm gonna leave out. Because the bottom line is that Mordecai would not bow down to Haman or to the king. And Mordecai got an audience with his niece and he said, our people are in peril. An edict has gone out from the king through the whole province, which is from India to Egypt. Ethiopia. Ethiopia. That was, that was a test. <laughs> and I like to spring pop quizzes on me because I know just because I said something, it wasn't hurt. Just picture in your mind where India is. Asia, right? And then you've got to go across thousands and thousands of miles to get to Ethiopia, which is down in Africa. So, He tells Esther the problem, and he says, I believe that God is calling you for such a time as this. She's the only one who could talk to the king, but the king had certain protocols. You could not knock on his door and say, oh, king, I need to talk to you. She can't even saunter by his room in a pretty new robe and hope that she'll catch his eye. He has to hold out his scepter and wait and he has to hold it out, and then only then 
can she grab hold of it and have an audience with the king? She says, all right, I'm going to do this. And she said, Mordecai, would you please have everyone pray? Everyone that we know in our community. In the, and she got everybody in the palace to pray. Everybody that they knew to pray. How many of you have people who pray for you? Hmm. Regularly, in a committed way, for more than a week? If you don't, please establish a prayer committee. And don't inundate them with every detail of your life, but ask them to pray for the things God has called you to do that you need help, like driving through rainstorms to come to Patterson. So anyway, she gets all dolled up and she goes outside of the king's chambers and <coughs> he sees her. And he says, Esther, are you okay? What do you want? And she said, well, I would like you to come to a special banquet that I'm going to prepare for you. So it's a Jewish tradition, and I'm sure it is a tradition of many other ethnic groups, that food is love. You in there? Mm -hmm. yes. Food is love. I, I mean, we had Passover Seder. I had enough food. We had 13 people. I had twice as much food as we needed. I bought almost 15 pounds of brisket, $120 worth of brisket, and we only ate half of it, and some of that half is in my freezer. <laughs> but you do it. So she says, please come to my banquet, and you can be sure it was something amazing. And uh, she said, and invite, invite your uh, top guy, invite Haman. So they come for this banquet, and they sit back, and. It, the food is delicious, and they relax, they recline on cushions, and everything is wonderful. And he says, so, so tell me, um, you know, what's, what's on your mind? What do you want? She said, she realizes she's piqued his interest. When you have something very important to tell people, you have to set context first, and you have to get them ready. So she realized she had done that, and she said, well, I will tell you. If you come tomorrow to another banquet, and Haman, you're invited to. So Haman's excited, he thinks he's so cool, he thinks something great is gonna happen, and they come back the next day, and she uses the protocol of the kingdom. She says, if it please your king, if it will be right in your eyes, O king, I need you to listen because someone wants to kill all of my people and they will all die. And he says, what? Who are your people? What are you talking about? And for some reason, that God knew the right timing, she hasn't told the king that he married a Jew. <laughs> so, he said, well, who did this? And she tells the story of how Haman had issued the edict in the king's name, and it went from India to Ethiopia. Thank you. And he was horrified. He was shocked, and he runs out of the room, and she says that it was Haman, and so Haman comes in, and while the king is out of the room, he lunges at her. She's lying on this long couch. She's just trying to get catch her breath. And the king comes back in, and he sees Haman on the couch, and he thinks his, that Haman is trying to rape his wife, and he gets hysterical, and he takes Haman, and, he's, and he says to people, take this man away. And as it turned out, Haman was hung with his wife and entire family, something they should have done to everybody from Amalek, which they did not. But everyone in Haman's family at that time was hung and killed. But the edict had to be rescinded, so they had to send out a new thing. The king had to write, and they had to, how did they get it? I mean, did they have cell phones? How did they get the message? Couriers. Hmm? Couriers. Well, they had couriers, they had messengers, they also had smoke signals. I did a research, they had, if you research communication methods, way back then they had everything. So, um, 
It was rescinded, but this is what was interesting to me. All of the non-Jews in this amazingly large kingdom from Ethiopia to India. 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 <laughs> the non-Jews were so afraid of the Jews that they became Jews. They wanted their power and influence. Have you ever had an interaction with anybody who said to you, you have something, I want it, I don't have it. Tell me how to get it. Has anybody ever said that to any of you? Yeah. We all want to be so contagious with the spirit of God that when people are in the same room with us, they catch it. That we are contagious with it. By the way, I've had four kids and six grandchildren. I don't care. Don't worry about it. So, ultimately, the Jewish people were not annihilated and they were saved. Well, what does this have to do with the bride of Christ? So, how many of you have been to a wedding in the last year? need to get out. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had seven careers, and one of them I didn't tell you about. Um, please do not be distracted by this, but I had a trademark called Queen of Bargains. And I was on television once a week, and I had a call-in radio show, and I had seven articles in Washington. DC newspaper a month, seven articles a month, and lots of other stuff that was attached to it. And I like bargains. And I wrote in my book, the Queen of Bargains Little Instruction book, that a wedding is only one day in the life of a marriage. Mm. But aren't there TV shows like about Bridezilla's and people who spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and stars who spend millions of dollars on weddings. You prepare for the wedding, spend all your money, you waste all your energy, everybody gets stressed out, and then maybe you get divorced three months later. Mm. You don't even give the ring back, you don't know what to do with the presents. The Lord wants us he already adores us, he loves us, he chose us. And we are to be his bride. Amen. And in order to be prepared to be the bride of Christ, maybe we don't need to do the lotions and potions and spa treatments that Esther went through, but we need to go through a thorough cleansing. Mm inside and out and it's not like fun it's not like going to get a pedicure before i met rabbi ron for a year and a half i went through by my own choice a process of trying to understand all the sin in my life i wrote it out and repenting of everything item by item by item. And as things come up, I sometimes need to repent again if it is still not as far as the east is from the west or if like Lot's wife who turned back when she was leaving Sodom and Gomorrah was turned into a pillar of salt. I don't want to become a pillar of salt so I don't want to look back. Which is why I let go of stuff all the time. I've been downsizing for years which is why I could leave all these apartments places and get rid of all my stuff because I don't want to hang on to the artifacts of my past. I just want to live in the present. And so the Lord wants us to go through this purification, self-examination process to help us be more fit to be his bride. Amen. And I have some other things to share about that. 
when I'm getting ready to do that. Um, I know I have a loud voice, you can hear it without a mic, but see this book. This is the Tree of Life version of the Bible. There are two versions of the Bible that are so-called Hebrew versions written by uh, groups of people, or one is written by a genius man who died last year, uh, uses Hebrew language, is so thoroughly grounded in Hebrew words, idioms, and um, the truth, the original Bible, as close as we can get to it. And somebody gave this to us as a wedding present. Oh, always wanted this. Right. It's, it's like big and heavy and expensive, though. We got it. Anyway, my legs are sticking to the cart. I want it. Okay. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 2 2, Scripture says, I remember your devotion as a bride and the way you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Well, I wasn't going to the wilderness, but I sure followed God's direction to many places. Israel was kadosh to Adonai. Now, anybody know what the word kadosh means except for your pastor? <laughs> it means holy. And in certain prayers we sing kadosh, kadosh, and we go up on our tippy toes. Kadosh, kadosh. So, this is something as I was preparing that the Lord revealed to me. When Jeremiah is talking about the bride of Christ, he is not talking about the church. A lot of people think that he is talking about the church, but he showed me that the first bride of Christ was his chosen people. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? He's speaking to the Hebrew people. And in that, God was heartbroken. We don't think of God as being heartbroken, but the people were stubborn and unrepentant and unsubmitted, unsubmitted and strayed. They walked after worthless things, becoming worthless themselves. Jeremiah 2.5. Okay, so if God doesn't want to do us to do that, how do we figure out what in our lives is worthless? I am writing another book called How to Make a Sauce Reduction of Your Life. So how many of you know what a sauce reduction is? You all cook here. Make gravies. I have to boil it down to that essence, that incredible essence flavor. I made Jewish brisket for the Aronson family. For Passover, they thought they wanted to have Texas brisket, and I tried it out on them in advance and passed muster. But when you bake it at a slow heat for 12 hours, you get a sauce reduction. All the vegetables are caramelized, and it's like you become addicted to it. I mean, it's just so delicious. Even kids who ate vegetables start swelling it all down. So, could you make a sauce reduction tomorrow of your stuff? I haven't been into your houses. I don't know what you have. I don't know if your closets are full. I don't know if your closets are empty. I personally have a goal. I've been told that we only wear like 10% of what's in our closets. I just want to own that 10%. Yeah. Now, Brown, I will tell you that I have more than 10% in my closet. Amen. But I do go through on a purge and throw stuff away. And if I buy something else, I go in and take something out and put it in the trash. The other day, he picked up a trash can and it was filled with stuff. And he said, you really want to throw this away? I said, yeah. He threw it away. So could you make a sauce reduction of the voices you listen to? Any of you listen to radio all day or have the TV on all day, sort of white noise? Mm -hmm. What would it take to make a sauce reduction of that? And if there are some people you listen to, which ones are speaking the truth and which ones 
are deceptive and not telling you the truth. Um, still in what you call the Old Testament, Adam and Eve in the garden, they were potential brides of Christ and they were unfaithful right out of the gate. And Hosea, the land is an unfaithful prostitute far from following Adonai. In what are we unfaithful? So I'm taking this analogy of a bride further and I thought, we expect a bride to be faithful and when you're betrothed, we were actually betrothed before the ark, before we got married in a special ceremony. And even though we didn't behave as a married couple, you could, I mean, according to law, Hebrew law, you, you could do that. We decided to be pure. It was very important to us to be pure during the entire courtship process from beginning to the very last second. So I, this is a homework assignment, and the next time I come here, maybe you'll tell me about it. What areas of your life can you make a sauce reduction of? In addition to the ones the that I've listed. One of the more um, exciting and curious books. What about, well, part of what's in your closet is shoes. Sorry. Um, but when we make a sauce reduction of any of the aspects are like the tangible things and the intangible things are habits. Uh, Something happens to improve ourselves, and we are also preparing to be the bride of Christ. Because the Lord wants loyal people. He wants us to have an <laughs> undivided heart. Amen. How am I doing? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I have a timekeeper. <laughs> so I wrote a book as my husband was dying. And I didn't publish it right away after his death because actually it was ministering to me and I wasn't ready to let it go. But in it, it's called The Divine Woo. And I'm going to read you a little bit of it from chapter 21, which is called Now is the Time. What are you waiting for? Then to the crowds, Yeshua said, and you know, Yeshua means Jesus, right? Yeshua, Mashiach. Yeshua said, when you see a cloud bank rising in the west, at once you say that a rainstorm is coming. And when the wind is from the south, you'll say, well, there's going to heat wave. And there is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret the present time? Why don't you decide for yourselves what is the right course to follow? If someone brings a lawsuit against you, take pains to settle with him first. Otherwise, he'll take the matter to court, and the judge will turn you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff will throw you into jail. I tell you, you won't get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Now is the time. Fall in love with God again, or for the first time. Doesn't matter how many times you have thought about this, now is the time to do it. Quote, amen and amen, I tell you, whoever hears my word and trusts the one who sent me has eternal life. Without Adonai, God, the Father, the Head, the Holy Totality, I call it, the Holy Amalgamation, all of the dimensions and pieces and parts of God, Yeshua can do nothing. I can do nothing, he says, I can do nothing on my own, for I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Listen again to more. Feel the energy surging through Yeshua as he pleads to the Hebrews to listen to him, to pay attention to the words and the desire beneath the words. Therefore Yeshua said this to them, Yes, indeed, I tell you that the Son cannot do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. And I want to get to... The next chapter, it's called A Deep Dive. Life with God is not a dip your toe in a pool. It's an all-in deep dive. 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, and his own life besides, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own execution stake and come after me cannot be my disciple. What would your life be without your stuff? Could I love God in wisdom and truth with holy joy without my paintings, my furniture, my clothing, my balcony with the 10th floor view, without my investments, my car, my books, my computer, my cell phone? Unless I am willing to consider this and lay it on the altar as Abraham laid his only son Isaac on the altar, I will never know. However, there's more. There's more. I'm looking for the part where Peter says he was stung in the heart. When he was with his friends, when they were fishing, and they met Yeshua, and he came up to them and he said, come follow me, he was stung in the heart. Have you ever been stung in the heart with the truth of God? If not, don't despair. Don't just pray for it. Cry out to God and ask him, please sting me in the heart. That's how badly I want to know you. Amen. <clears throat> as I was writing this book and as I talk to you now and as I think back over significant events in my life, and especially when I read in scripture, and it's written there at least five or six times, go to the ancient marketplace, go to the ancient pathways. That's where the wisdom is. And every time I read it in Jeremiah and in Proverbs, my heart starts to pound. And I'm thinking, why don't other people hear this heartbeat of God? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and reread those books until your heart starts to pound for God. And you'll know it. It's not a fake thing. It just happens. So right now, I would just like to pray for all of us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church. Thank you for your pastor. We thank you for every single person who is here. Lord, we want to be stung in the heart. We want to be prepared like Esther was to be the bride of Christ. We don't want to be left out because we fail to submit in one thing. Please inspire us, Lord, to lay all of our failures on the altar, not to feel bad and wallow in them, but to please you. You love us so much. You chose us from before the beginning of time. And let us feel that and know it and long to follow you and cry out to you until we are stung in the heart and can do nothing but follow your will for our lives. Why? Because we love you. Yeah. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Would you stretch out your hand and pray for Joe and I? You know, when you've spoken before Congress and you speak before literally hundreds of thousands of people over a period of time and teach governmental, uh, write book for the government and so on. These classes is different than standing before the body of Messiah. And we need your prayers Amen. and your grace and your love to cover us. Amen. You know, Esther, she counted everything as lost. And church, it's time for us to count everything 
as long as yes. to prepare for the splitting of the sky Amen. and the sounding of the shofar and the return of our king. Yes. Yes. But Jill didn't share with you tonight. We've talked about Ron Cantor talked about Washington, D.C., a young man from Israel. There's been 57 attempts of genocide through history to kill our people. 57. And now we're called the genociders. And now we're called on campuses around the world and other places as the evil ones. Why? Because Satan only has a limited time left. Yes. And he wants to scar the bride before the king returns. But how many of you know that the blood of Yeshua our Messiah cleanses and purifies us? Yes. Amen. Would you pray for us? Yes. Just prayer was coming. Yes. You come and lead to come. Just stretch your hands forth. Yes. 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 Press your hands before towards the Father in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for Rabbi Ron and our sister Jill. Lord, I thank you for this awesome union, Lord God, that you have brought together, Lord. I thank you for the time of preparation, even from the time whenever she was a young girl and he also as a young man, Lord, and all of the seasons that you have prepared in their lives, Lord God, for such a time as this. I thank you, Lord, that you placed them in the right place at the right time, O oh Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that you had a plan, Lord, for you knew the thoughts that you had towards them, Lord. Thoughts of hope, O oh Lord God, a future and an end, O oh Lord God, that you had planned for them, O oh Lord. I thank you, Lord, that by your divine grace and your sovereign hand, you would open up the doors before them, Lord. That you would lead and guide them, Lord, and even as Rabbi Ron was speaking to me earlier, Lord, how he talked about spontaneity and hearing the voice of God. I pray, O oh Lord God, that in these days that are left before him, Lord, and his lovely bride, Lord God, that he would hear your voice more clearly than he ever did before, O oh Lord. I thank you, Lord, that they're not carrying extra weight and that they are instead prepared for spontaneity, for the intersections of life that you plan to bring them towards, O oh Lord. I thank you, Lord, for a great outpouring of your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. I thank you for an open heaven above them, Lord, and that you would pour out the oil of your presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon them, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that the word that you have placed on the inside of their hearts, I thank you for the word tonight, O oh Lord, word of submission, Lord, a word, O oh Lord God, that would be willing to submit to king and kingdom, O oh Oh Lord, a word of repentance, a word of cleansing, oh Lord, a word of sanctification. I thank you, Lord, that you have called a bride that would not have spot, blemish, or wrinkle, Lord. You're coming back for her. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you continue to just speak the truth of your word in their lives, over their lives, and through their lives. I thank you for open doors of opportunity, and I thank you for the mighty anointing of the Holy Spirit. We're claiming souls Lord, more souls for your kingdom through this ministry, Lord God, that disciples would be made. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the one that is going to do the work, and you're the one that's going to go before them, oh Lord God. We're just giving you glory and honor and praising you and thanking you, Lord, for the awesome work that you have prepared in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the amen. Lord. Well, Father, we just thank you for tonight and this, this wonderful time together with your Mishpacha, your family. We pray, Father, the essence of the of the, everything that's been said is to direct us into a, a personal, closer relationship with you, to change us, Lord. As Joe was talking, I was challenged to examine my heart where I needed to some, have some improvement in my life. And I thank you, Lord, that you pointed something out very clearly I thank you, Lord, that you love me so much that you're not going to let me get away with anything. That you love me so much that you want me to be able to stand before you, Lord, and to hear you say, well done, good, faithful yes. servant. Lord, this is the goal of the gospel. This is the goal of our life. 
This is the goal that Esther would, would give up her own life. It didn't matter. And Lord, help us to get into the reality of the, of the gospel of the Lord. That every single one of the disciples died for the gospel. Every single one, missionaries that came to America died to share the gospel. We sent missionaries out to the world that died for the gospel. We, we barely live for the gospel, let alone die. I pray, Father, that we just get a glimpse of what we should be in such a day as this, in this time, in this place. Bless this group, Lord. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious. Lift up his countenance upon you. Bring you peace. Oh, God, send your peace upon this group here tonight. Guard us and guide us and bring us back tomorrow for a special, special time with you. To be able to sit at your table. To be able to drink from your cup. To be able to eat from your word. Your word, the bread of heaven, Lord, in Yeshua's name, amen.